Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Coral Gables Congregational United Church of Christ. I'm Lori Hafner. I'm the senior pastor here. And on behalf of all of our members and staff, we are so delighted to welcome you. And we are so honored to continue to share in our partnership with FIU and with the Florida Grand Opera and with all of you to be here for such a special afternoon. I will just share with you that this particular church was established in 1923. So next year, we are celebrating our 100th anniversary. We're so excited. For those of you who come from New England or from Europe, you're rolling your eyes when we think that we're so ancient and old here. But for Miami, we're pretty darn old. But we love being here, and most of all, we love opening our doors for these kinds of opportunities for the community to come in. We are very committed to the arts and to education, to justice issues, and we are once again so honored and delighted that you are here. So without further ado, I call up my good friend Pedro, who is going to share with you some more about this afternoon. So thank you. Thank you, Pastor Lori. I'm Pedro Bota. I'm uh, Executive Director of the Stephen J. Green School of International Public Affairs at FIU. And on behalf of the school and on behalf of our newly appointed interim dean, Dr. Shlomi Dinar, I want to welcome all of you um, to our event this afternoon. Um, we're delighted to be back in this beautiful space. Um, this is the seventh, I believe this is the seventh collaboration between the Green School, uh, the Florida Grand Opera and Coral Gables Congregational United Church of Christ. We've gathered like this since 2015 to explore powerful universal themes related to the human condition. The Green School is so grateful to Coral Gables UCC and FGO for this enduring collaboration. These strong partnerships really allow us to bring an incredible depth of programming to the community. I want to acknowledge the Ruth K. and Shepherd Broad Distinguished Lecture Series for its generous sponsorship of today's event, as well as the st steadfast support of the city beautiful Coral Gables. Today, we'll enjoy a very special program that explores life in exile for Cubans in South Florida. A New Life examines how cultures and traditions bend and reshape when confronted by the realities of migration and the inevitable shock that ensues when a people find themselves living in a new land. Mass immigration from Cuba reached an all-time high in the 1980s. And so we ask, how did Cuban society recreate itself in South Florida? Our program is inspired by Florida Grand Opera's inventive reimagining of Domenico Cimarosa's Il Matrimonio Segreto, an 18th century Italian comedic opera reset in a Cuban household of 1980s Miami. Today's event would not have been possible without the invaluable help of my friend and colleague, Dr. Jorge Duani, the director of FIU's Cuban Research Institute. Since its founding in 1991, the Institute has been spearheading groundbreaking research and programming on Cuba and the Cuban American experience. Its work is nationally and internationally recognized and its affiliated faculty represent the largest cohort of scholars outside of Cuba working on these themes. And I would be remiss without a special thank you to my colleague, Dr. Ofelia Riqueses, um, the senior program coordinator of our Václav Havel Program for Human Rights. Dr. Riqueses did much of the heavy lifting to organize today's event and has been spearheading a number of events for the Havel Program, exploring themes related to migration and human rights. And a special thank you to my colleagues, Dana Fernandez and Cindy Mingus, who organized the reception we will enjoy after our presentation in Fellowship Hall. Uh, now it is my pleasure to introduce my dear friend, Susan Danis, the General Director and CEO of Florida Grand Opera. I don't want to make Susan blush, but I think it's fair to say that under her leadership, Florida Grand Opera has emerged as a world-class cultural institution in South Florida. And we are so fortunate indeed 
to have this jewel in our community. Susan. <laughs> Thank you, Pedro, and thank you, Pastor Lori. Uh, we are thrilled to be in our seventh year of this partnership. And as I thought a little bit about it today, I realized that the operas that we've explored up until this point have been really serious operas. As you all know, as opera fans, many of you, lots of, uh, lots of death, uh, lots of murder, um, and the exploration today is a comic one. Uh, we started back in 2015, and we talked about the diaspora experience, we, we spoke about the Holocaust. We explored the life of um, Cuban dissident poet and activist Ronaldo Reynas. And last year, we talked about the Lavender Scare. So we've taken quite a journey over the years. But today, and you'll be learning more about the opera in a minute, um, we actually are dealing with a comedy. And I was the person with the crazy idea of moving this from uh, the late 1700s, early 1800s to 1980s Miami, and particularly setting it in a Cuban family. Um, it is uh, very much our company, but my homage to the community that I've come to adopt and learn about over the last 10 years. And so many of the elements in the plot and so forth were just so perfect. Um, we had a very wonderful team, uh, a team of Latinas, who came together, uh, the stage director, the, the, um, the costume designer, the, scen the scenic person, uh, everyone, and really explored this. Uh, and very much a lot of how the plot was formulated came a lot from a group of women, Cuban-American women that were from their 70s down to their 30s. And the stage director, who is Latina, but she's from Puerto Rico, uh, we called it her Latin American, and in particular, her Cuban posse. And this is really the group of women that steered her direction to look at this piece and really understand the entrepreneurial spirit of Cubans in the 1980s in Miami. And so this program today celebrates that, and I hope you won't miss the opera because we've commissioned a special Spanish translation of it. This opera is usually sung in Italian. I believe it's the first time an Italian opera has been translated into Spanish to make it even more about Miami. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn the program over to the program director of our studio artist program, uh, Matt Cooksey, who's gonna tell you a little bit more about the opera and also introduce the musical selections. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susan. I have to start off my remarks by saying that my great-grandmother always wished that I would be a music minister in a church, so this is about as close as we're going to get today. <laughs> I'd also like to say that the panelists that I'm joined with today, I think, are going to bring a great depth of experience of the Cuban exile community here in Miami, both as academics and writers. So. I am going to leave that a little bit on the side. My kind of area of expertise is in opera, and so what I'd like to start with is talking about what Matrimonio Segreto started as. Uh, as Susan referenced, the opera was first premiered in 1792. If you're vaguely familiar with opera history, uh, you might kind of pinpoint that as the end of the classical music uh, period. So this is right after Mozart passed away in 1791, and the opera was first premiered in Vienna. Vienna at this time was kind of one of the opera capitals of the world, right next to Paris, Rome, Florence, uh, and several other places around the globe. But Vienna uh, basically had the government capital uh, behind the Austro-Hungarian Empire to bring some of the most talented composers from Italy, Austria, Germany, even some composers from Spain and Russia to the court to ply their trades. And that court theater was started by Joseph II. If you've seen the movie Amadeus, it is that same emperor who had an Italian opera company open for nearly 50 years. 
Now, this is one of my favorite periods of opera to study because the court theater there was actually a repertory theater. They had the same, about 12 singers perform about 14 operas a season. So imagine, if you're one of our singers here, imagine that in a season, you are responsible for learning 14 operas, and you're going to learn six operas that are new every year. It's quite the daunting task. So Cimarosa, originally, he starts out in Italy, in Naples. He develops quite a name for himself and, in fact, was far more prolific than Mozart. In his lifetime, he wrote 80 total operas. Uh, but he wrote his first one at 25, and that basically garnered the attention of Catherine the Great. Uh, she hired him to come to St. Petersburg, and he was there for a period of about five to six years. The only problem was there was a Spaniard named Vicente Martini Soler, who is basically just better, a little bit more well-liked. And so Catherine the Great took a shine to Vicente, and Domenico had to start making his way back home to the Italian peninsula. But on his way, he was commissioned by Joseph II's brother, Leopold II, and basically said, how about you write an opera for me? And so Cimarosa agreed. And so he's using a lot of the same uh, singers that Mozart was using, along with other composers like Salieri, Sarti, Paisiello, and he writes an opera based on an English play called The Clandestine Marriage. It's by two different playwrights, but essentially it is built on the back of 18th century contrivances, a very simple problem that's compounded by mistake after mistake after mistake. The fun thing about operas in this period, especially for comic ones, is that typically the librettists would try and set their action as close to home. So they might be set somewhere within the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Typically, that would be in Italy, but you might see an occasional show that would be in Austria. Sometimes they would send it off into the Ottoman Empire if they wanted to have a little bit more spicy story, but typically very close to home. Now, this opera should have been a smash hit. It premiered in February 1792, and the audience loved it. They requested many encores throughout the performance, which at a time was actually prohibited at that particular theater. The only problem was that Leopold II, the following month, died. And so after he died, there basically was no longer a proponent of music within that Habsburg dynasty, and so the Italian Opera Theater folded, and Cimarosa goes back to the Italian peninsula. But after he goes back to Italy, the opera is performed all over Europe, making quick premieres in Italy, in France, and later in England. So it quickly became a large part of the repertory. But the question you're probably asking yourself is, why would we not set it where it is? I think that's a good question. But we have to look back to the treatment that the librettists and even the impresario at the time were applying to these productions. Keep it close to home. And where are we? We are, of course, in South Florida. We are in the heart of Miami here in Coral Gables. And so that's why we've given this a really great treatment, bringing it to Miami Beach, infusing some Art Deco uh, design along with that 1980s vice. So if you really miss that time of just seeing vibrant colors and just beautiful people on stage, this show, I think, will have you quite well covered. But as Susan also mentioned, this is about the entrepreneurial spirit of the Cuban family and of a group of people that are trying to essentially start a new and better life for themselves in the United States. And of course, our panelists, I believe, will be able to speak a little bit better to that. So at this time, I'd like to invite up from the Cuban Research Institute at FIU, Jorge Duani, to introduce our first speaker. Thank you, Matt. 
Good afternoon, everyone. I'm actually going to introduce our three speakers, so uh, we won't have any more of this coming and going uh, at the front and make it easier for, for you to follow. So the Cuban Research Institute is happy to co-sponsor today's event and to present three outspoken, outstanding speakers who will help to conceptualize and contextualize the historical development of Cuban-American culture here in Miami. First, let me introduce uh, Dr. Michael Mustamante, who is the Emilio Bacardi Moro Chair in Cuban and Cuban-American Studies and Associate Professor of History at the University of Miami. He's an expert on Cuban-American history as well as on current Amer uh, Cuban affairs. He's the author of the book, Cuban Mem Mem Memory Wars, Retrospective Politics and Revolution in Exile, and co-editor of The Revolution from Within, Cuba 1959-1980. Our second speaker will be Ana Menendez. She is Associate Professor with Joint Appointments with the Wilsonian Public Humanities Lab and the Department of English at Florida International University. She has published four books of fiction dealing mostly with Cuban and Cuban-American topics and has worked as a journalist in the United States and abroad. Her new novel, The Apartment, which is scheduled to be published in June, hopefully will be, will be presented here or perhaps at Books and Books as well. Finally, we'll hear from Ua de Aragón. Dr. de Aragón was the Associate Director of the Cuban Research Institute at Florida International University until her retirement in 2011, right before I came in. She has published more than a dozen books uh, of, of essays, uh, poetry, short stories, novels, and a play. Her most recent publication is El Reino de la Infancia, Memorias de Mi Vida en, en Cuba, 2021, a memoir of a child in Cuba, which we also presented right here at the church last March. I hope you enjoy the three spoken interventions along with the performance from the new version of the opera El Matrimonio Secreto. Without further ado, I turn it over to Dr. Bustamante. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, let me start just by thanking all my colleagues from FIU for the generous invitation. Um, I was asked to say a few words from a historical perspective to try to sort of set in context what's happening in the Cuban-American community in the 1980s. Um, so I'm going to do my best uh, in, a, in a few brief minutes here. Scarface, Miami Vice, more recently, cocaine cowboys. Can I say that word from a church pulpit? I'm not sure. These are just some of the popular media texts that have chiseled into Americans' collective consciousness a fixed representation of Miami in the 1980s. That representation has stock features, neon, members-only jackets, fast cars and boats, even faster money, foreign-sounding accents and names pursuing their version of American or Americano dreams decked out in gold chains. It's the kind of image and visual style that, oddly enough, I'll forever associate with the logo of the Miami subs chain. Um, it's also the kind of image that, for outsiders at the time and ever since, conjures a perception of danger combined with allure. Just listen to this rather condescending passage from the late Joan Didion's classic 1987 travelogue about the city a travelogue which was and remains predictably brilliant at times, but as my colleague Ana Topico once put it to me, also engages in a Miami version of Orientalism repeatedly. Quote, I never passed through security for a flight to Miami without experiencing a certain weightlessness, the heightened wariness of having left the developed world for a more fluid atmosphere, one in which the native distrust of extreme possibilities that tended to ground the temperate United States in an obeisance to democratic institutions seemed rooted, if at all, only shallowly. At the gate for such flights, the preferred language was already Spanish, end quote, God forbid. <laughs> Stereotypes, of course, are sometimes rooted in kernels of truth. So common images of Miami in the 1980s are not totally divorced from some realities of life here 40 years ago or today. But just as the infamous Time Magazine Paradise Lost cover from 1981 unfairly cast an entire region as little more than a den of drugs and decadence or a dumping ground for third world problem peoples and refugees, we do ourselves a disservice to limit our collective recollections or even nostalgic celebrations of the city's most infamous decade to the sordid tales in Billy Corbin's latest documentary or Robin Farsad's recent nonfiction romp through the international underworld of mystery headquartered uh, in Coconut Grove at the Mutiny Hotel. As a historian of Cuba and the Cuban American community, I take this challenge seriously because the 1980s were a tumultuous, yes, but transitional decade in ways not captured by the narratives that most frequently appear in print or on TV. 
It's that transitional context, politically, culturally, and otherwise, that I want to explore briefly uh, in the hopes I can help illuminate the particular backdrop against which this reimagining of an Italian opera has been restaged. Esta no es tu casa, esta casa es provisional. This is not your house, this house is provisional, shouts the curmudgeonly patriarch Pepe Peña at his daughter Carmencita one evening in an early episode of the beloved bilingual sitcom Que Pasa USA. The joke continues, aquí en Miami nosotros estamos de pasada, ¿entendiste? Here in Miami, we're just passing through. Got it? The studio audience roars. Now, I may be cheating to start my journey into the Miami Cuban 1980s with a reference to a television show from the late 1970s, though in fairness, Que Pasa USA's final season did air in 1980. Be that as it may, in this joke, or more precisely, the fact that it was a joke at all, I believe we see an early sign of an already ongoing but still nascent evolution that would become ever more apparent in the years that followed. I'm referring to the evolution from exile as the predominant identity formation available within the, the Cuban community to an emergent concept of Cuban American only just coming into being. Allow me to explain. For years, the idea that Cubans were just passing through Miami was a deeply serious matter. The counterpart to the exile's faith that next year he or she would be in Havana after Castro's presumed downfall. But the fact that in the late 1970s, Pepe Peña's comment about his family's temporary Miami existence could be the butt of a joke suggests that by this point, the exact opposite had become self-evident in many ways. Exile was becoming permanent migration. Families were deepening roots. There was no simple going back as much as many still wanted there to be. To be sure, the advent of the Reagan administration and its more muscular anti-communist foreign policy revived hopes for a post-Castro future to an important degree. The concerns and politics of exile never went away, and they still haven't, of course, particularly in a decade wherein first the rise of the Sandinistas seemed to replay Cuban exile Cold War nightmares, and then the eventual crumbling of the Eastern Bloc by the end of the decade seemed to suggest Cuba might be the next socialist domino to fall. But at the same time, some Cuban exile preoccupations of old were fading somewhat against an increasingly aspirational forward-looking present, especially as the bicultural children of the early post-1959 exile were coming of age. That present was Cuban American, focused on accumulating success, prosperity, and influence in the here and now, not so much on what was or what could be in the home country. The Que Pasa theme song is instructive in this regard. It's not Cuando Salí de Cuba by Luis Aguilé, but Say Hello America, We Are Part of a New USA. But at the same time, Cubans were beginning to claim a greater Cuban Americanness, or leaning on the latter half of that hyphen. The Mario Boltlift of 1980 came and re-Cubanized the community in important ways. On the one hand, this could be seen as a positive. After seven years of little direct migration from Cuba since the closure of the Freedom Flights in 1973, the sudden arrival of over 100,000 Cubans in the United States, many settling in South Florida, revived use of the Spanish language, re-energized re commitments to anti-Castro politics, and brought a kind of cultural renaissance as dissident artists and intellectuals of the Mariel generation began working and writing in Miami. On the other hand, from the vantage point of some of those new Cuban Americans, Mariel also had the pernicious effect of re-otherizing the community as a whole in the eyes of Anglos within and beyond the 305 at a time when the Cold War inspired welcome that had greeted the original post-1959 exiles, both in terms of popular attitudes and US refugee policy, was ceding to a rising immigration restriction movement across the United States. This was exemplified by the internment of roughly half of the Mario refugees in military camps across the United States for several months in 1980, and the indefinite detention of a few thousand. Indeed, despite the passage of the 1980 Refugee Act just a few weeks prior to the Mario boatlift breaking out, most Mario Cubans were not granted formal refugee status under the law, but were instead given a more provisional immigrant uh, status or category entrant. The fact that Mario coincided with an economic downturn locally didn't help, nor did a simultaneous Haitian refugee crisis or the justified anger in the African American community over the worst treatment that the, those refugees received. And this is to say nothing about the reaction to the murder of Arthur McDuffie in the middle of the unfolding Mario crisis itself. It must be said, though, that as much as many Cuban refugees of old saw the Mario migrants as successors to their own migrant story, many were family members after all, 
Others sought to protect their emergent Cuban Americanness and success story from the contaminating effects of those other more racially diverse working class socialized under socialism Cubans that had just arrived. They are not like us. There's even a Que Pasa USA episode that parodies these themes. The aspirational Cuban Americanness of the 1980s was thus not only the product of time or natural evolution, it was also the flip side to class and racial anxiety. In situationally claiming greater Americanness through the 1980s, Cuban Americans who hailed from the exile generations of the 1960s and early 70s tacitly sought to secure their status in their new homes against newly ascendant discourses of othering, and just as importantly, uh, began seeking greater access to the local halls of political power that to that point had largely excluded them. And yet beyond the distancing from troublesome Marielitos, there was a symbolic price to pay for such access. It is not a coincidence that in the fall, the fall of 1980, saw the passage of a referendum that declared Miami-Dade an English-only county. In so doing, city voters overturned an earlier measure from 1973, I believe, that had declared Miami a bilingual city. Cuban exiles and Cuban Americans fought the measure, seeing it for what it was, a last gasp of nativism against the changing demographics in the city. But it is revealing that in the very decade that would see Cuban Americans' economic, political, and electoral power begin coming into greater maturity, the English-only law stayed on the books and would remain there until the early 1990s. Which brings me back to Didion. Today, we take it for granted that to say Miami is to say Cuban. Not only, of course, but certainly to a strong degree. Still, even as late as 1987, as Cuban exiles were becoming the Cuban-American leaders uh, tomorrow, this was not so obviously the case. Didion says, and it's worth reading a passage uh, at length, in part because it's its reference to Florida International University, one of our sponsors here. <laughs> Quote, neither the photographs of the Cuban quinceañeras nor the notes about the cocktail at the Big Five were apt to appear in the newspapers read by Miami Anglos, nor for that matter was much information at all about the daily life of the Cuban majority. When in the fall of 1986, Florida International University offered an evening course called Cuban Miami, a guide for non-Cubans, the Herald sent a staff writer who covered the classes as if from a distant beat. And this is a quote from the Herald. Already, I have begun to make some sense out of a culture that while it totally surrounds us has remained inaccessible and alien to me, the Herald writer was reporting by the end of the first meeting. And by the end of the fourth, quote, what I see day to day in Miami, moving through mostly Anglo corridors of the community, are just small bits and pieces of that other world, the tip of something much larger than I'd imagined. We try to ignore Cuban Miami, even as we rub up against this teeming, incomprehensible presence." End quote in the Herald, end quote from Joan Didion. To return to the 1980s then is, if nothing else, to return to a time when, despite a new Cuban-American ascendance, there was still a world within a world quality to a, that teeming, i.e. exotic, dangerous, dramatic Cuban Miami, in contrast to the sense today that Cuban Miami, or broader Latin American and Caribbean Miami, is the world in which all of us who live here, Latino and non-Latino, in some sense operate. That, of course, is another transition, not without its complications and tensions, but it marks an important distinction, I think, to contemplate. Thanks very much. Thank you very much for that. We're going to move on to something a little bit lighter. So I'm going to set up the scene uh, that we're about to hear from the opera. So as I said earlier, uh, 18th century opera is built on a simple problem that has maybe a simple solution and no one takes it and does something way more complicated. All right, so the simple problem in this opera, we have two people, Carolina and Paulino. They've gotten married. Okay, that shouldn't be a problem. Well, Carolina is the younger sister. All right, that might be a bit of a problem. And they haven't told dad, they haven't told the aunt, no one knows, so they've secretly eloped. Now, they have some reason for optimism because Paulino has found out that his boss, Count Robinson, who in the original opera is portrayed as an English kind of gentleman who's visiting, uh, and he always struggles to speak Italian in the original opera. I'm sure you'll see a lot of that humor transcend into our production as well. But 
Count Robinson has come. He's brokered a deal with Geronimo, which in our production, he is running his own Hotel Paraiso on Miami Beach. And so there's a power brokering of marrying off the older daughter to Count Robinson. Perhaps some cash will trade hands, but everything should be going a-okay. And so when there's so much good news, perhaps we can break a little bad news. That's what they think. We'll see if that's the case in Act 2. But for now, enjoy this duet from Act 1, Yo Te Dejo, from El Matrimonio Secreto. I said it's a it's a fun opera no one dies in this one 
Our next speaker has a very close connection to Miami. Uh, she moved with her family during high school. She went to Florida International University, wrote for the Miami Herald covering Little Havana, and also had a lot of literary efforts that you heard about earlier in our program. I think that we are all very happy to welcome to the stage Ana Menendez. Thank you. That was fabulous. What fun. Thank you so much. Um, it's a joy to be here. Uh, real delight to be among Ua and uh, Michael, Jorge, Pedro. Thank you. I'm going to share a very brief memory of 1980s Miami. I was 13, part of the first generation born in the United States following Castro's revolution, hatched into a land of waiting. We were Cubans who were temporarily, we thought, forced to live inside another culture, part and not part of America, that odd land that we both admired and reviled, a country of loose women and feral children and freedom and soon Ronald Reagan. <laughs> Years before, our parents had packed their middle-class, mid-century values in Havana. And though these threads emerged wrinkled and irreparably damaged in exile, our parents insisted on dressing us in them. 1983. These were Viva Porru scented days of lechones and encuentros en los parques, of pullovers and baseball, y te llamo patra, and sorry con excuse me, of going to El Tenseng and drinking Sietupe and figuring out if you had to light candles to this new sun giving. Of boys who sweated dracar noir and wore gold chains and drove their Camaros too fast, but not so fast as to spoil their rims. Of going to parties that always ended with couples tightly swaying to Europa. Parties we pause now to note that a respectful girl could only attend in the company of her chaperona. I see some co-generationals uh, uh, with me. Good to have you. Chaperonas, <clears throat> the original mothers of invention. Without them, would we have perfected the skills of slipping out of bedroom windows in the middle of the night? <laughs> would we have come up with the exquisite pastime of making out next to the Volvo in the garage after everyone else had gone to sleep? Without chaperonas, how would we have learned that lust is one part hormones and three parts illicit thrill? Without these stern tias, would we have even noticed the fields of bliss that lay just beyond their gaze? My eldest cousin, we'll call her Sarah, to protect the innocence of the past, was 16. My other cousin, who had just arrived from Cuba, was 15. Let's call her Marisol. She was profane, exotic, fearless, everything that I, at 13, was not. Sarah had one of those Dracar boyfriends with a Camaro, and every Friday and Saturday night, they went on dates. For some mysterious reason unknown to us children at the time, our family had abruptly abandoned the idea of adult chaperones. Instead, beginning that summer, Marisol and I would serve as Sarah's chaperones. So there we were alone after dark, a homely 13-year-old in plaid and denim, and a vivacious, non-English-speaking 15-year-old emigre, both of us in charge of a pair of horny 16-year-olds. <laughs> we ended up at Bird Road Park, where Sarah promptly told us to get lost. She handed over the keys to Marisol and vanished into the moody tropical pine land with her boyfriend. Back then, the streets around the park were nearly deserted at night and very dark. Marisol, who had no training as a driver, much less a license, took me on the wildest, most heart-stopping adventure of my life. <laughs> she wheeled around the corners, tires screeching, and swerved into the oncoming lanes while I screamed and laughed like the terrified hysteric, which I was. 
The agreement was that we would give Sarah an hour and then return, tooting the horn twice. And Marisol was determined to keep up our end of the bargain. So there we were, a bunch of teenagers on the loose. So much could have gone wrong. A cop could have stopped us and driven us home or even arrested us. And then the world would have ended, but not in the way you think because it would have ended in Spanish and El Mundo Se Acabó can also describe a heavy rainfall. So it would have stormed for days at home, but it wouldn't have been an actual English language style apocalypse. If this were fiction, something would have happened to us on Marisol's wild ride something bad and irreparable that we would continue to look back on all these years later. And maybe someday I'll write that story. But in this story, nothing at all happens. We drove around, we met only a few other cars, we didn't crash, no one turned us in. It was the 1980s and Miami had bigger problems than a couple of teenage scoflaws in suburbia. Marisol somehow got us back to the park. We gave our signal the lovers returned, and a lot of us headed home before curfew. It was the last summer of the kind of carefree childhood that, though it took place in Miami, in memory I always associate with Cuba, the flawed paradise where all good things came to pass. We didn't know it then, of course, but Sarah's mother, 41 years old at the time, would die within the year. And only now, writing this, do I realize that my aunt's illness was the reason the family abandoned the use of adult chaperones to a sorrow more painful than tradition. In time, not only the word itself, but the very concept of a chaperona would also be abandoned and would we, we would be left to our American selves. Walking into the big house in La Sahuesera that evening, we were children for the last time it would take us a few more years to formulate the phrase, but we already had the sense that we were where we were supposed to be. Our parents waiting had become home. Thank you. Absolutely beautiful storytelling. Um, it's a very hard act to follow. That was very moving. Um, we're going to move forward into act two now. So lots of things have gone wrong by this point. Uh, Count Robinson, he comes to the hotel. He takes one look at Elisetta, who is the older sister. He really doesn't see much about her that he kind of likes. But he takes a look at the younger sister, Carolina, and he says, now that, that I do like. And so over the course of act one, he starts pursuing Carolina. Geronimo is looking after his investment, trying to make sure that this marriage goes through. At the beginning of act two, the two of them meet and basically organize a swap, saying that perhaps Robinson and Carolina can get married. But that of course presents problems to the young married couple and so on and so forth and so on and so forth. So, this trio is between Geronimo, the father of the household, his sister Fidalma, who is kind of the money in the family, kind of keeping the business afloat, and Eliseta. And basically, Eliseta and Fidalma want to kind of make this whole Carolina problem go away. Eliseta really, really, really wants Paulino for herself. Oh my, we've got another problem added on top of this. And so they come up with an ingenious plan. Perhaps we need to take Carolina out of the situation completely. We need to just send her away anywhere, maybe even to a convent. Let's just send her there, get her out of the way. So is Geronimo going to look after his money or after his family? You won't find out exactly in this trio, but you're gonna see him really get put through it. This is Que Cosaria from El Matrimonio Secreto. Y bien, esta persuadida ilusión a este matrimonio. Oh, 
due che vorrà dire, ben famosissimo. Ma se io lo sento e che dice un
So later this week, we will actually be joined by our stage director, Elena Arauz, and our uh, conductor, Dar Darwin Aquino, who is actually the librettist who made the new Spanish translation. So we will very quickly start rehearsing this production in full, but I really want to thank our studio artists for preparing these scenes for the concerts we performed this weekend and today. Very nice work, you all. And now we will move on. Oh, thank you. Our final speaker of the afternoon is Uva de Aragon. And I have to say, I read her story on History Miami's website last night. It is a fascinating account of coming to Miami and uh, in the aftermath of the Marielle boat lift. It's a fascinating story. Look it up online. Her her work and her career included both literary and academic efforts where she was an associate e uh, editor of the Cuban Studie, and uh, that's of course an academic journal that's one of the most important Cuban journals in, uh, in our uh, academic field. You can tell that I'm not a part of academics with uh, speaking like that, but please welcome to the stage Uva de Aragon. I'm very happy to be here and grateful to have been invited um, and grateful to all the participants and organizers. It's uh, really a beautiful activity. Um, when I read the libretto del matrimonio secreto, it really took me back to the 80s, not so much because of the theme, but because it reminded me when I was doing my graduate work I went to school, not late because it's never late, but older. And when I was doing my graduate work at the University of Miami, and as um, I am sure that the opera um, fans know, the Golden Age Theater had a lot of influence in Italian opera, the same way the Commedia della Italiana had influence before in the Golden Theater. So I'm going to delve into all the many academic works of this influence, but um, just want to mention that all these plays that I studied then, de Lope de Vega, Juan Ruiz de Alarcón, Tirso de Molina, are comedias de errores, comedies of errors, which is what we have in this play. And the tension is created by the series of misunderstanding often bringing to light the difference between the nobles and the servants and the danger of disturbing the balance of power. These mix-ups always include love and invariable, invariable end up in a wedding, most often two weddings. Um, this is a parenthesis because of what um, Anna talked about, the Chaperonas, it really wasn't until I studied Spanish literature that I realized why I had been subjected to chaperonas in my adolescent years in Havana. And even in New York, when I was about to get married, my mother would send my fiance and me with my youngest sister to buy furniture and all our wedding stuff. We couldn't, you couldn't buy online then. And I would tell her, mom, we're getting married. We have an apartment already. We both work. If we wanted to have sex, we'd go to the new apartment, you know? And she said, ay, pero que dirán si nos ven solo? So I couldn't believe what would they say if they saw it in New York where we had just moved and we didn't know anybody in that big city. <laughs> but the reality, I understood that when I, under, when I studied um, Spanish literature, because the honor is the most important thing in Spain, and it's based, believe it or not, in a woman's virginity. And you can see that from El Cantar del Mio Cid to Don Juan Tenorio to just cite a couple of, um, so that was the reason. Um, I, it also brought me back to the 
80s because I have moved to Miami in 1978 from Washington and New York. And then my parents uh, had just retired and moved with us. And I was married at the time and had two daughters, uh, ten, ages 15 and, um, and 10. So I can see at the 80s, um, because I lived through them in Miami, but also a little bit as an outsider, because I hadn't lived here all the time. And I think that my household was an example of that threat to the balance of power, because my parents, well, between my father and my youngest child, there was a 70-year difference. So it was several generations. Actually, you should look online that issue of Paradise Lost, where everything is bad except there is a short story, a little, those um, boxes stories about my, 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 our family because they were looking for a family of three generations living together. Actually, I think it was like five generations living together. Um, the first time my youngest daughter bought a bikini, Ardio Troya, it was, <laughs> God, it was like all hell broke loose. And I had to end up telling her, you wear it under your clothes and don't tell your grandparents. And believe me, I always try to, to have them tell the truth and be honest, and I'm pathologically honest, but there was no other way. <laughs> I think that is an example of what was mentioned of the differences between the generations, even though I had been born in Cuba, I came at 15, and you know, my parents were older, so I was more, I was going to school, I was planning my future, and they were still thinking that we could go back. Um, the 80s, I think, I would put two bookends. One, in 1979, if I'm not wrong, because I, did, I thought about it right a few minutes ago, and I didn't check it in Google. So I might be wrong, but I think it was when Somoza was uh, fell and the Nicaraguans started arriving, which meant that Miami stopped being totally Cuban. We started getting other Latin Americans. And then, and I'm going to talk a little bit what happened in the middle, the other bookend is the fall of the Berlin Wall 10 years later. What happened in the middle? Well, the Marielitos came. And Mike already talked about that. Um, they, how they contribute to change our city, um, how they contribute to the language. They brought something very interesting to our city, uh, which are the street vendors. There weren't people selling flowers and lemons and stuff in the street before the Marielitos. And then they brought some very talented people like Mirta Ojito, who's a Pulitzer Prize and Emmy Award winner, and all the generation of Reynaldo Arenas, and I think that's a story that he, that he read online. Um, at the beginning, the Cuban exiles of older generations embraced the Marielitos, but then um, there was a lot of crime because, as you might remember, um, Castro opened up the jails and the mental hospitals, and of course, then the Cuban older Cubans um, they even founded face facts about Cuban exiles, um, trying to tell the story of success of the earlier. Um, exiles and distance himself a little bit from the Marielitos, a word which was used sometimes with contempt, sometimes with affection. But something happened else happened during those years, and I really didn't focus on it until I started thinking about the 80s. Um, I remember that, that there were, what now seems normal, um, these Friday gallery openings in Meeting Point, which was located where Books and Books are, is now. Books and Books is a small store in Aragon and Salcedo, and there was Mitch Kaplan starting his bookstore. I used to work half a block from there. I would go there at my lunchtime to browse up books, and maybe buy one on payday. And um, Carlos Luis, the late Carlos Luis, had um, Meeting Point at that, and Dora Baules Faldi had Forma, and Cuban art started became, um, a lot of Cuban artists started to well known, a calzada among them. And a lot of Cuban people, including myself, became collectors of Cuban art. 
And then Nat Shediak would uh, start playing movies, foreign movies in La Cinemateca. And um, Ernest, Mario Ernesto Sanchez uh, started the Avante Teatro. And all that turned into the Miami Book Fair, the Miami Film Festival. We all started in the 80s. Um, the, my, the National Hispanic Theater Festival, which really put Miami in the map, culturally, international. Art Basel had started in the 70s, but it really took off in the 80s. So between, among all the problems brought by the Marielitos, which eventually were really, um, I don't think today you can tell the difference between a Marielito and somebody who came in the 60s. I see there's more distance between the people who came from Mariel and the people who are coming now. And there's distance in time and there's distance in culture too. Uh, but these events uh, put Miami in the map. The, another important international event, and I will, is, was the fall of the Berlin Wall. And that took us to dream and dream and dream um, or a post-Castro era. There were conferences, there were radio programs, and we were all going back to Cuba again. One of the good things of that miscalculation was that comedy of errors uh, was that um, many, um, for example, because of trying to contribute to that transition in Cuba, many universities started studying Cubans more deeply. And that is the reason the Cuban Research Institute was created in 1990. It was exactly because they did a work for the State Department the year before about the transition in Cuba. And that was the reason in 1991 that the Institute was created. Other organizations like the Association of Cuban Economists which my friend here, George Mortaban, belongs to, was created also because of that idea that their return to Cuba was imminent after the fall of communism. Of course, it didn't happen, but in the meantime, it gave us a lot of good Cuban studies. So, um, um, this mix-ups did not end in weddings. <laughs> like it does in the plays and the opera, and I really like to congratulate the singers for their marvelous performance. But indeed, as years passed, um, there's been an integration of these factors which shape then and contribute to Miami being today the vibrant, multicultural, and diverse city we all enjoy. Thank you very much. Once again, following a wonderful speaker, and I just want to uh, offer my very heartfelt thanks for all of our speakers today. I think you brought something that I certainly would not have been able to bring to light. Thank you. For the studio artists that know me uh, at least for a week now, they know that I'm more of an improviser than somebody who goes from prepared remarks, even though I wrote them already, we're going off script. Um, my own personal history with Miami is a rather short one at this point. Uh, I moved down last September, but my parents actually worked in Miami during the 90s, and so they would pass along stories to me before I came of, oh, you've got to go here, you've got to see this, make sure you do that. I remember when, this is my dad's favorite story, I remember when I went into the University of Miami locker room wearing a Florida State shirt and Jimmy Johnson yelled at me and almost got me fired for my ticketing job. That was a real story. 
And so there's a certain uh, mystique that comes with Miami, and it's been something that I've been trying to uncover myself uh, over the last year. Uh, the very useful book to me was The Year of Dangerous Days, which was all about 1980, and that really certainly brought to light a lot of the things that we're still dealing with um, as citizens here, either in Miami-Dade or in Broward County. Um, but I think that that's what this discussion has done a really great job of kind of parsing. It's, it's examining the Miami mythology, the iconography, those things that make us smile, the things that make us really proud to live here, and juxtapose that with the reality of many groups of people that have come to Miami that have tried to find a place of their own while still holding on to their original heritage. And so I'm very proud to, uh, one, be here today presenting this production. I hope you all will join and see how we are executing what I think is a real love letter to this town, to this community. And I thank you very much for your time. And let us all go to a nice reception in the back and have a wonderful day. Thank you.